Willkommen im Flicklabor. Ich bin Karri. Sie sind wahrscheinlich Henrik. Jawohl. I take no part in that one. <laughs> I should not have even tried, but I already did it. Welcome to the Flick Lab. Henrik, how are you? Well, <coughs> at this point I'm already recovered from the hangover of the century, so in that sense now I'm doing pretty okay. Excellent. Yeah, it seems that traveling or lack of traveling is bad for your sleeping rhythm. Or overdoing the notes for the show, whatever the I, excuse might be. I, I can vouch on both of those cases. <laughs> yeah, which affected our recording schedule, but here we are finally. I'm recording from Wazienki Park in Poland, in Warsaw. It's a little bit cold, I suppose, around 10 Celsius. Most people have already left that have a brain. It's a little bit windy. Some uh, ducks doing the rah, rah, rah on occasion, but otherwise I should be good to go with here. Let's just hope there n- will not be any knife crime during this podcast. Seeing how you are in Poland, I hope that you have are currently making a big fuss how you are going to m- make a podcast episode about a film that takes a sympathetic look towards the German soldiers on World War II. Yeah, in that sense, I am kind of in a suitable location. Yep. Well, Henrik, I am Karri, and we are two Nice Finnish. to meet you. <laughs> <laughs> do, do you, do you, do, do you frequent this podcast often, Karri? I come around these parts a little bit here and then. We are two Finnish guys with exposure to media studies. One of us has most definitely overexposed himself to cinema, and the other one of us likes to concentrate on technical aspects of films. If you're a newcomer to this podcast, I'm sure you will find out who is who in no time at all. Henrik, we do not have a guest. This time we have to be on with our own guns. Yeah, well, a lot lucky for us, today's movie is actually taking on the World War II and... Well, all the characters are basically Nazis, so in that case we are pretty much A-OK. We are in clear waters. So it is. What's your experience with this film, Henrik? I actually have never ac- seen this film before. Yeah. I, that... I do remember that you did speak highly of the movie when we were, uh, some time ago when we were talking about the future episodes which we we're going to do in the future, but the film itself has been a completely new experience for me. Well, I'm happy to hear that you have this experience, at least now. Maybe kind of amazed that you haven't seen this since it's coming from a kind of a respected director from Germany, but who the hell has the time to see all the movies in the world? So great to have something new for you too in this podcast. I too have my thoughts when it comes to being a congeneur of of cinema. And there are those times when keeping up to the heretic traditions are so I would deserve to be burned at the stake. Yeah, Henrik, I saw this film as a kid from our Finnish state-owned TV and it made a lasting impression on me. As a kid, you kind of assume as a viewer that everything will turn out fine, that the kids are good. Okay, after all, I remember being afraid of dark scenes at night, of the fog, then seeing everyone get killed. It's it's all for nothing, Henrik. No, nothing at all is at stake here, except their lives. Yeah, so it, spoilers to our, all our listeners, the crowds die at the end of the film. The, <laughs> that's brutal. Yeah, you could say that. I think this film affected me quite deeply as a kid. Henrik, what's the synopsis for this film? Do you have one or should I roll? I guess that what best simplifies this movie is that it's a story about a group of boys who actually do act like soldiers and do what they are goddamn told to do. Yeah, there are 
young boys who have all their personalities and their worries at home and at some point it just goes so that they become the faceless crowd in the marching order. It's a real story of seven boys, 16 years of age. They get called to the army, the last days of the war. Guess we'll just jump into the history. Di Prique was offered to director Vicky by a chance. It kind of rolled from there. He auditioned almost a thousand boys. He finally chose about 200 or 300, had screen tests for all of them. They were all amateurs. They settled for seven. Which means that if we have anything to, anything to complain about the performances given by the kids in this film, that pretty much is the best that Germany has to offer. Yeah, it's based on April 27th day, if I remember correctly, of 1945. And things get so rough that they have to get kids to the army, but they are quite enthusiastic about it, Henrik. And everybody wasn't quite brainwashed to the young Hitler Jugend group. There were some small towns where it wasn't so prominent, but the propaganda seems to be so strong for the state still that these boys are enthusiastic to join, at least in this film. Yeah, the film does still make a strong point that even though they, I guess the propaganda is not on its strongest on the town that these boys live in, the propaganda still very much exists in that town. There are still the party leaders and there is that enthusiastic Nazi ideology which these boys, even though have been kind of a put under and they have been influenced by that. Yeah, and it's based on a real story. It's a story that appealed to the director very much, which is why he chose it. He also believed it would offer him some future possibilities in director's chair. And it most definitely did. He was still a young filmmaker at the time. Brücke kind of went against many of the conventions of the time in German cinema in the ways that uh, it was not easy viewing and it doesn't follow the genre cliches. You could also say that it probably has a little bit more fast-paced cinematography than what people might have been used to at the time. At points it does, and at points I think it really does take its goddamn time. Yeah. This is based on a novel, actually, which I tried to get my hands on, but was unable to find it. It's really hard to find, even in the library. But it's... Yeah, a, I, yeah. I had a similar problem you did share on the background material which we went through you did send me that one master's thesis that covered the mistakes and the process of translating the book to english but yeah. even even from that you kind of get the impression that the book itself is kind of a no show in most of the libraries and literary circles, so that it's kind of a hard to find. It would have been a pleasure to read, but uh, no is a no, and Manfred Kreger wrote it. To change the mood to anti-war in the film, more clearly at least, the plot stayed intact, but the characterization was changed. They die because they were brought up to do so, which has also been their playground, the bridge. Which is also kind of surprising because while searching into the book that the film is based on, I on my end found the notion that also the book would be an anti-war story. And I understand it is, but maybe not as clearly as it's supposed to be. Okay, so the director still felt that the anti-war message didn't come through as strongly as he would have wanted. Because the thing about the book is that the writer was in inner turmoil because he had been one of the seven kids at the real event and I am not sure if he left his friends at that bridge and fled or did he just feel some inner pain because he was the only one that survived the ordeal. At least he... and well this is my understanding that at least he did feel some inner pain on what happened and for his role in taking part in the events on the bridge because I did found a quote where the 
writer said that the book was his attempt to explain to the world how as a young kid he could have been so goddamn stupid as to take part in well what happened okay you read it like that that he was stupid because he joined i was thinking that he was stupid because he did something that he thought was cowardly but uh, uh, yeah, i, my, I my don't t- have enough context Neither do I, because also tracking down the writer and finding information about the writer himself was kind of a task which I, on my end, wasn't completely able to pull off. But my take on that quote was that he was trying to explain his mentality and motivations why he took part in the war. And why he was on the bridge when he was. Yeah, this was not perceived by some viewers as an anti-war film at all. There was this journalist Klaus Norbert Scheffler. He pointed out in an open letter to Vicky in December 1959 that especially the young viewers did not perceive the film as an anti-war movie. They rather enjoyed the presentation of violence. And there was a film historian Lotte Eisner. He saw the bridge even as a glorification of Hitler youth spirit, but these are, of course, just separately picked opinions of some people, and I just bring them up because it's uh, something that would never cross my mind, so... Yeah, I, I also, seeing the film, I didn't get that feeling, but I can kind of understand the rationality behind those sentiments. Yeah, especially during those times. Especially during those times... Especially in German, which still is struggling with the legacy of the Nazi Germany and still feels bad, extremely bad for what happened. Exactly. The setting of the town in the book and in the film is not clear, but in the book there are some hints that suggest that it's somewhere in southern Bavaria. Again, I'm not sure exactly where this took place in real life, but some modifications seem to have come into the book. So, anyway, the writer grew up in southern Bavaria as well. Which would kind of lend a lot of gravity towards the take that the book also would take place somewhere around those parts. Because the story itself makes it extremely clear that they are very close to their hometown when the events finally take place. Yeah, makes perfect sense. Do we have anything on the actors? Well, I do have something about the director of the film, whose work I still haven't seen that much. But I've seen some pieces from here and there. Maybe the most notable kind of or most well-known film... Outside of Deep Rücke that the director has taken part in, even though not directed completely, is The Longest Day. Which was mostly American production, but Vicky did direct the German parts of that story. And The Longest Day, I would say, is a film that most of our listeners, I guess, would be familiar with, since it's extremely well-known war movie. Yeah, his Hollywood uh, tryouts were kind of a mess he tried his hands there at least twice on both occasions he didn't get the final cut and he saw the final result of the film in the theater and was petrified of the what he saw on the screen so it was studio edited to the point of destroying the film in his opinion and so he left hollywood came back to germany his austrian uh, actor and and a director actually he was kind of a big character in shaping the cinema after world war ii well his family was communist and this caused him a lot of pain when he entered back to berlin at one point and was actually taken to a concentration camp and got out of there actually and he was told to never come back and I think you don't really need to be told that he went (laughs) back to Austria studied finally became a director actually had a lot of interest in photography but it was a interesting beginning he thought of photography as a second-rate art 
but became completely hooked after going to an exposition and started to photograph right after. Was often called a perfectionist, uh, like a control freak. And that's usually when you get the best films, Henrik. Occasionally, yeah. Well, not every time. To gi- give you a completely opposite example would be Mike Myers and the Love Guru. <clears throat> yeah, I had something like Orson Welles in mind. <laughs> but actors. I guess from the actor's side, the most mainstream or most well-known names would be Fritz Weber, who in the film plays Albert Mutsch, and who had a partly Hollywoodish career. He did perform in the film Cabaret, which is a, a drama musical, very much a cult classic at this point, and well-beloved movie, and also the sports drama The Games from 1970. And... From the German production side, I guess Volker Lechtenbrick, or yeah. uh, however you would pronounce the name. However, the guy who plays Klaus Hager in the film, and maybe Michael Hintz. But I guess to me the most famous of the two is Volker, who has done a quick role in the extremely campy and very terrible German action thriller TV series The Clown. Okay, you've seen it. I did see it. I didn't see the entire series. It, it's basically, it's a, it's a series, six seasons and a TV movie that also worked as a pilot. And was it Nelonen who actually aired the whole Japan in Finland at some point? And it's basically, if I remember correctly, the story is that there is some kind of a Uber cop or Uber commando or someone else who goes through a personal tragedy and as a result of that decides to turn into a kind of a vigilante crime fighter who uses a clown mask to hide his identity. Okay. And it's exactly as good as that description tells you. Kind of tonally way away from the Brücke. But uh, Volker Lechtenbrink Indeed, I found that he is an actor, but also a singer, has 13 albums, has some director credits too. The Bridge was his first film, and basically almost the majority of the boys here are newcomers to the world of cinema. Fresh faces, picked from those thousands of kids. Then there is uh, Frank Glaubrecht, or however the fuck you pronounce it, uh, playing Jürgen Borchert. Jürgen in the film volunteers for the military service to kind of emulate his fallen father's footsteps. He is kind of the most known for being the voice actor in the dub German television, often playing Pierce Brosnan, Al Pacino and others. Also debuted in Bridge, known for a lot of TV, but also was in two West German Italian productions. One of them is Geheimkode Wildkense, code name Wild Cheese. And then we have an action war film, The Commander. Also has done a lot of voice work. And about Michael Hintz, he plays Walter Forst. He is the son of Ortsgruppenleiter. Somebody might know what that means. And, <laughs> <laughs> and ashamed of the cowardice of his father who also cheats on his wife in the film. Started in theater, his first film also The Bridge. And yeah, this is the guy who was in The Longest Day and The Last Escape. Although to me it's unclear how big this or small these roles are for him. It's it's very hard to say. It's been ages since I last saw The Longest Day. But yeah. if I remember correctly, it very much is from the Allied side. The entire film, so it's very possible that Hintz would simply be the German soldier number 52 who gets shot when they finally take on the Normandy beach. Absolutely, and then we have the writers, mainly Michael Mansfeld. Actually was born in um, Leszno, Poland. His other works are Destination Death, <laughs> Der Transport, and Witness Out of Hell, Zeugin aus der Hölle, and TV movies and theories. 
And then we have Carl Wilhelm Vivier, responsible for the captain and his hero, the Hauptmann und sein Held, and Meine Kinder und ich. Also, Bernhard Vicky, the director, gave some of his talents to the writing. But yeah, Bernhard Vicky, tough guy, tough guy, a really influential director in Germany and won a lot of international prizes. Yeah, I came to understand that this film, Die Brücke, was something that helped turn the global attitude towards Germany after the Second World War. Whereas before the film, the rest of the world pretty much hated Germany for what they had done, understandably and rightably so, and the film was one of those first steps that German took to, through popular culture, to actually explain their point of view and where they came from. And this way helped to bridge the two sides, Germany and the rest of the world, and kind of a, create some kind of a comprehension on what had happened and how it could have happened. Yeah, indeed, like, it takes a little work to get your mind space in those times. It was just 15 years after the Second World War had ended. So things like these were actually huge, I would imagine, at the time. I would believe also. Yeah, when cinema still had its huge influence and would change people's minds towards nations. Yeah, and when basically cinema and art are together are are maybe one of the most transportable and most exportable forms of communication that you can have, because most people are not going to see the trouble of reading a 300-page book where you try to actually explain your point of view and the point of view of your people, but watching an hour and a half long film is much easier task, so kind of a in, in those moments, trying to express yourself and trying to explain yourself through art, through cinema, it really actually can be a form of communication that is easily approachable and also easily consumable. And this way, it holds some weight as a form of communication. And I can very much see that, well, since there wasn't huge communication held, towards Germany, and Germany itself was kind of a looking how to explain itself. In this context, a film that can easily be exported outside of Germany, I can believe that it must have helped a lot for Germany to explain itself. I listen to some new filmmakers nowadays who are enthusiastically telling that when they are about to release a new film that if we were able to change worlds and minds with films like 50 years ago we can with this and that film we can do it nowadays as well but i don't think that works that way you know you still have a lot of influence with cinema moving pictures but it will never have the same effect when you go to the theater drag your ass there it will probably be your only chance in your lifetime or in a long long time before you can see the film again, which would be for like a home consumption made VHS tape or a DVD. At those times, you know, it's hard to imagine now, but you go see Die Brücke in a theater, and after that it's gone, you don't get back to it. It's like a once in a lifetime opportunity and experience, until you get to the VHS stage. I, I don't know, I, in a way, I guess, yeah, could, could be like you said it. On the other hand, Maybe at this point, because films are so easy to get your hands onto and they are so easy to consume, you can watch them whenever you want, there might be a chance that the message you are trying to portray might actually have easier time to reach its audiences today. Because today to be heard is no longer a question about does your film reach the audiences during the limited theatrical release which you are going to have? Today it's more like I make a film which has this political message I want people to hear and maybe they miss it in on cinema but I can kind of account on having a second chance in Netflix or on DVD or something like that. Yeah, there's also that. Alright. Let's go to the scene by scene. 
Uh, let's do that before you freeze to death out there. <laughs> <coughs> let's. Okay. Let's get an overview of our cast of characters. So we have Walter first, played by Mikhail Hintz. He's the guy that runs for the train to his mother. We have Klaus Hager, played by Volker Lechtenbrink, the guy that I mentioned was a singer. Then we have Hans Scholten, played by Volker Burnett. He reads the poem during the class. We have Albert Mutsch, played by Fritz Wepper. We have Jürgen Prohert, played by Frank Klauprecht, the kind of a leaderish guy who went to the cadet school. We have Karl Horber, played by Karl Michael Balzer. He's the guy who sees Barbara doing some dirty stuff with daddy. We have Sigi Bernhard, played by Günther Hoffmann. He's the guy who's standing up during a raid and dies first. Of course, we have this love interest of Klaus. Francisca, played by Cordula Trantl. All right, that's the most important. I trust, Henrik, that you found the German audio track on this DVD instead of the autoplayed <laughs> English dub. I actually did y- listen both of them. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I also checked the English audio track and made the notion that the English subtitles that are on the DVD are actually way better than the English dub. Okay. Like, they, they kind of go in weirdly hand in hand. There are parts in the film which the dub explains better than the subtitles. But at the same time, the dub makes really odd mistakes, which I really can't understand how the hell they've actually, you know, managed to fuck these small things up. To uh, give you an a- example, there is the moment later in the film when the teacher of the boys goes to visit the army barracks to talk about to one of the generals asking, pleading for him to save the kids. And during that scene, the teacher makes the point that he and the general are both teachers and colleagues in that sense. And the general counteracts that he has been a soldier now for five years. And for some odd reason, the dub makes him to say that he's been a soldier for six years. Okay. So there are these small inconsistencies between the subtitles and the dub. For my end, I really couldn't understand where those mistakes kind of stemmed from. Back in the days, it was easy to make such mistakes when there was nobody to fact check these things. So in the dub sense, I understand that not that much attention was paid to the details I would imagine uh, this was done in the early 60s we start with Siggy's mother she's working as a laundry lady comes to collect clothes we get to know Siggy has been called up there is the scene with mom of Jürgen the mom of Jürgen she is more of an affluent type of a person she works on a farm foreign workers are working at her farm there's a lot going on here and actually it's sometimes pretty hard to keep up with the subtitles and the dialogue because it's really, really packed. And it is, and, it is, and the dialogue and the subtitles kind of move past you extremely fast. Like if you, if you follow this one with subtitles, at times you actually have to struggle to, to be able to read the subtitles in time. True, true, but also it seems that the dialogue comes quite naturally sometimes. Uh, You know, the kids at points are talking over each other just like kids would be doing and they... Yeah, it sounds very natural. There's an interesting notion made by Jürgen's mom tells the friend of hers that the family, the Borgherts, have always been officers hence it's supposedly okay that this style continues for kids and she doesn't even bat an eye when saying that directly to her friend. No, that, and that scene kind of, um, is one of the first that makes the notion about this German mentality back in those days. Yeah. Where, where this certain type of honor and certain type of dignity was held on an extremely high regard. To a point where it's perfectly normal for a mother to accept his son volunteering for the army simply because... Everybody in the family line has been officers beforehand. That is also kind of a notion that I guess still carries kind of a worldwide. There are still those families 
which, for example, every male of that family line has served in the military, and because of that, there is that unsaid pressure for you, when your time comes, also take part in military service. In a way, that is also something that exists in Finland to this day, where it's kind of expected of you that when you hit a certain age, you will join the military and you will do your service. There's also another example of this cold and calculated behavior later when the girls at the school are playing ball and there is this instructor that doesn't ask but actually orders the boy to pick up the ball. And I thought this moment was kind of off. The boy was doing nothing bad and the instructor was behaving like you need to succumb to my will right now. Yeah, I I took it as a part of the old world values, the old gentleman behavior, where you are expected to behave in a certain way and do, for example, this kind of a small things automatically and constantly. The kids have the lesson that, according to the subtitles, is an English lesson, that there is zero English spoken on this English lesson. This is very easy to understand if At those times, especially, they wanted everybody to understand everything. Still, it's kind of weird. It loses authenticity. Perhaps not a big deal at the time. Anyway, uh, right after this, we are shown how Walter's mother is now taken to the journey by Walter's father. The mother takes the train, and there is a huge dismay of Walter's anger, as we will see in more detail later. And there are all these conflicts, Henrik, in all of these goddamn houses of the kids. And I was wondering, like, what was the overarching point? Was it that they already, you know, have anyway the will to me? So in that sense, it's funny how much we use the time of the film to show that there are conflicts at the home. So what? They're gonna join anyway. But maybe that gives you the extra push to go. I don't know. I didn't feel that there was was these tensions in every house. Yeah. For example, the mother who takes care of both Hans and Albert, that household does not show any signs of kind of these inner turmoils. Yeah. And also, I think in Jürgen's household, there really is no conflict inside the house. Jürgen and his mom, they ain't in a conflict. Jürgen's mom's attitudes and the values that have been taught to her son, they are harmful. And in many ways kind of a twisted, but Jürgen has accepted those values and those teachings and actually just goes along with them. So they are not in a conflict, they are just very much on the same side. Unfortunately for Jürgen, that side just happens to be extremely wrong. Yeah, it's more about the documentary style of filmmaking once again, I would say. And so, so this kind of is weird what, what's happening in Germany just before the war is about to end and people are going to bomb the town. Yeah, I, I took that as a simply the director trying to show the different walks of life from which these kids come from. Yeah. In Carl's case, what I took away from the household scenes is that the household itself is very, well, it, it's a loving in a sense, even though Carl's dad is what once again showcases this tight, uplift, very stoic uh, German attitude, and Karl himself is kind of a victim of yeah. overacting hormones and very misplaced affection. In the forced household case, it's to showcase to the audience that the German morality wasn't something that was very tightly kept by everyone. The forced household scenes kind of make the case that Walter's father is kind of at the pillar of the community in a Nazi sense, since he's the leader of the local party section in the town. But at the same time, the father is also extremely immoral and very dubious in his behavior and his actions. He's someone who cheats on his wife. He's someone who expects everybody else to hold the line 
and stand up and do their effort during the war times but himself he is the first one to actually try to run away from the war and from the approaching enemy. So he's someone who keeps double standards constantly. There's the double standards and we are shown the class differences really clearly. The Jürgen's household is very affluent. They can afford servants. Then there is something like Sigi's household which is very very lower class. Yeah, yeah. Sigi's household is a bit more lower on the social hierarchy. And then we see Jürgen on horse with her mother. There is uh, some underage smoking and at the time it seems that this is perfectly all right. I couldn't find information, but I suppose at the time this was perfectly acceptable. Uh, there was the mo moment in time, I, I don't know, was this global attitude or was it only in certain countries? But yeah, there was even that one crazy moment when smoking was considered to be good for your health. Yes, indeed. But uh, here we are given the notion that uh, Jürgen blindly believes in everything that his father has said to him and also kind of puts down his own mother when he challenges her. And there is the notion about using the wood. This seems to be the big theme in this film. There is wood needed for hiding tanks, there is wood needed for the treehouse, there is wood needed for boat, and everybody is out of wood. I guess there's nothing really to read into it, but it seems to be like a big theme. It is a good call. I myself, I completely missed it until now that you mention it. Because you are actually quite right. The wood is the most used material and the most used element throughout the film. Yeah, maybe it's just displaying the shortages of the time. Or through wood, the childish games, like the treehouse and the boat, they eventually tie into the much more realistic war effort. Because there, there is the notion made by Walter's father that the German war effort needs wood and they are claiming wood for the war effort and for the victory, as Walter's father states it. And in a way the wood in, in the film is kind of also used to control the people and the elements, like Jürgen's mom is kind of in high regard in the town, because she has wood, uh, which she can give to the war effort, and later on, which she can also give to the class, to the school which has the boat building project. The wood controls the war effort, the wood also controls the school, in a sense. The school can't have the boat project advance without the wood from Jürgen's mom. And later on in the film, the kids use the wooden roadblocks to try to control the usage of the bridge. It very much can be just reading too much into a small detail in a film, but the wood kind of shows up throughout the film as a mean of a control. Something made out of the wood is needed by someone or it's been used to achieve something. Yes, and indeed, there is the scene where at Albert's home they are planing down the boat parts and a notion is made about the letter that they have not received a letter from the family father in 23 days, but uh, Albert tells his mother to calm down. Must there be like a break in the postage chain at the moment, if an offensive is taking place right now. And there is the scene where the boys get to the bridge and we see the treehouse. Siggy is in the treehouse. There's established more of this relationship with Klaus with Francisca. Siggy shouts for Klaus, but maybe he doesn't hear or care. This Klaus and Francisca Kind of a love story is interesting. You can see the infatuation of Klaus very much, but then later on, when they have their final moment, he cares more about his watch than saying something nice. Kind of showing that to the audience that he is still a kid, and kind of also showing that at this time in his life, kind of naively, the war is more important. Again, I can also see very much Klaus's point of view on that scene, because Klaus actually has very strong point. If they would have to go on a nightly scouting mission or anything like that, Klaus would very much need his watch. Even though the luminescent effect of the watch is something that, well, to be completely honest, 
could be extremely dangerous on battlefield conditions because someone else might also pick up on that luminescence. But still, in a way, Klaus does has the logic on his side when he asks his watch back. And I do love... I do love Francisca's expression on that scene when Klaus asks his watch back. And that actually is my favorite scene of the film. Simply because, you know, because of that panning to Francisca's stunned <laughs> face and extremely disappointed yeah. look on that moment. Yeah, I like it a lot there. We are given the information that uh, this maid is having some kind of an affair with the father of Carl, which is why the mother was sent away. It's more of these problems at home. Hans and Albert go biking, they are bumping the tire, and uh, also kind of interesting that Hans admits that he was scared during the air raids when he was close to the air raids. Kind of actually building up the idea that Hans is kind of the most mature, and it shows time and time again, when they are at the bridge, he's the only voice of reason. That he is, and... I also took it kind of a critique on the German mentality back at the days because this kind of a fearlessness and not being afraid it was something that was kind of a held in a high regard and hold as a big value in the Nazi ideology. So in that sense now when Hans admits that he was afraid I also took it kind of a critique against the Nazi mentality. Yeah. Then there is this little side story about the alcohol. They find brandy and schnapps or whatever. And here the dialogue is really, really fast. Later on, Siggy goes get some of the alcohol, but is busted by the cop. And is told about a possible three-year prison sentence. More of like a scaring the guy. The mother at home wishes that Siggy would actually get the sentence instead of going to the army, but... Just quickly, the policeman says something that I'm busy here, I'm on a shift, so goodbye. So that doesn't happen. Yeah, the policeman does not want to interfere on the situation since Siggy is actually shipping off to the army. Yeah. And to, to me that was kind of a showcasing once again the argument that what to later on happens on this film, what happens on the bridge, it very much is the fault of the parental characters and it's very much the fault of the authoritarian characters of the film. Because in the film, the village cops have two possibilities to actually intervene with what is going to happen and even take part in preventing the loss of the kids lives and on both of those accounts they fail to act in both of those cases they fall back on the same excuse in this snob scene where the cop apprehends Siggy and Siggy's mom pleads with the cop the cop does realize that he actually has a chance to save Siggy from the military and from the front lines simply by following his duty and doing what is expected of him from the law side. Apprehend Siggy and put him in jail for having the snobs. And that would actually keep Siggy out of the front lines. And later on in the film, the cops apprehend the officer on the village and the officers pleads with the cops that they should actually go with him to the bridge and see that there are kids whose lives are on danger. And once again, the cops refuse to do this. Instead, they start to apprehend the officer and they kind of once again fall back on to this is my duty, this is my job, I'm supposed to do this instead of actually doing what kind of a would be right thing to do in that situation, which would be taking the time to walk with the officer that you have already apprehended to the bridge and see are there actually kids on that bridge. So both cases, the duty is used as an excuse not to act. And yeah. in both of those cases, precisely failing to act is something that actually leads into the loss of lives. Yeah, it's a really bad luck and just plain old stupidity at play here. It kind of suggests that the corporal just leaves the kids at the bridge, even leaves his gun there. But then again, 
he is really clear to one of the officers that he's going to inform the bomb squad that they are almost ready to go and blow up the bridge. Then again later on the bridge bomb squad arrives to the scene anyway so it looks like this guy was plainly on the run at this point. I took it so that he was actually simply, you know, going to the town to, you know, grab a cup of coffee and chat with the bomb squad since... Could be. Yeah, simply out of, you know, not wanting to hang out outside on a bridge during a cold night and instead, you know, went to inform the bomb squad and at the same time, you know, have time sit nicely inside somewhere but then and again the time. why would he punch the officer in the stomach and just basically risk his life for that he could have just continued to tell to the officer that we have to go to the bridge now and i will show you the situation that would have been kind of the smarter choice maybe to pull off on that situation but then again the village cop makes it clear that he's not having any of it like he's not going to listen to the corporal instead he's once again is going to do his duty he's going to apprehend the corporal and haul his ass back to jail and just you know not bother with the situation anymore after that. I, I took that scene as the corporal actually being worried for the kids and punching the village cop was something made out of desperation because corporal knew that he should not be taken into jail or no one will hear about the fact that there are kids on the bridge which they are going to blow up. Yeah, it's a sad state of events. So much could have been avoided. There's a soldier training and during this their first day of training in fact the teacher tries to appeal to the officer captain Fralich, that the kids would need to be returned to their homes as soon as possible this falls on deaf ears actually his own kid just died a few days ago and this is interesting this whole teacher thing way back in the classroom he said that we'll soon need more train drivers than soldier and Jürgen then asks why would the teacher make such a comment and I would say that from the beginning it's established that this teacher is very much against the Nazi party but of course cannot openly talk about it it could be read in perfectly in two ways this sentence but still he tries to at every turn save the kids yeah I, I also read it so that the teacher is very much against the Nazi ideology and the war itself but he can't be too open about it because it would be grand treason from him to say anything against the party and say anything about the Nazi line because that is kind of how fascism tends to work that you establish an order and you establish extremely heavy penalties to everyone who dares to raise their voice against your opinion and against your stance and that fear of heavy punishment is then used to silence anyone who does not agree with your side and that is kind of a, the, the problem where the teacher himself ends up in the film where he is against the Nazis but he can't say that out loud in a fear of punishment and he does not believe in what he is teaching to the kids in the classroom, which is this German valor and high honor, which leads the kids into this nationalistic mentality that drives them to be extremely enthusiastic on joining the military and fighting in the war and protecting German soil and all this nonsense. The teacher does not believe in these teachings but he has to teach them still because not teaching them once again would merit a punishment for him indeed and only in the first day it's established that that situation is hopeless during the map drawing scene and there it goes the importance of the bridge is not huge still even though there's this officer who says that it's not important the other officer says that it should be defended anyway and the other guy agrees and so it happens they are there on the back lines leaving the barracks and their leader is corporal heilman just for a little while there's a weird scene where this higher ranking person says that 
No noise, no unnecessary excitement. The senior asks what the corporal has also learned in seven years of tenure of army. He answers to keep out of the way, sir. That's what I expect you to do. But what does it mean, Henrik, you know, to keep away from what? To keep the children away from the real action? To keep himself away? Keep the corporal away? Did he just tell the corporal that they must now all die? Or what, what's the point? Or is it just, to, you know, protect the kids and keep them on the back line so nothing happens there? I guess that's the answer. I, I took it so that the, what was asked was to keep the kids away from the fighting troops. To keep them out of sight and out of mind because the military leadership is afraid that having the kids with the troops on the front lines as they are in the film it would have a demoralizing effect on the troops that are fighting because the kids could get scared and that scaredness could affect the other soldiers and take away their morale. Yeah and some morale is taken. Immediately in the food queue, these kind of scenes become more and more frequent. This guy in the food queue says that he will report the other guy that is shouting at him. But there is no really... Everybody already knows kind of that they're... they're at least that's my take. That there would be really no credibility to any report threats because everybody is fleeing the scene. So who are you going to report to? Yeah, and to take the note that at this point most of the German troops are both kind of disillusioned by the war, they are tired of it. I took it so that most of the adults, most of the seasoned soldiers in the film actually know that the German is very much losing the war at this point. The officers openly state that they kind of already know that the war is kind of a lost cause at this point and I would very much believe that the soldiers fighting on the lines also have kind of a seen that the allies have advanced too far on the German soil that any turnaround would happen in this war. They know that Germany is losing the war and it's only a matter of time when they have finally have to give up. Yeah, and now the real action is about to start. Now we leave the kids to the bridge. Actually, watching this now, again, it kind of surprised me how much of the movie is happening before we get to the bridge. There's a lot of like building up and building up and building up to this moment. And by now we have really well established all of the kids' stories and what's at stake. And everybody else goes to the front lines fighting for their lives. But the kids are left at the bridge. They are not happy to stay in this environment. They are not expecting to get any adverse shortcomings. And the corporal leaves. They are up to their own devices. Demolition squad is apparently meant to come and demolish the bridge at some point. At the latest at dawn. But it wasn't really even so much of a joke to leave the kids there. Judging by the unloading of the goods because there's plenty of ammunition left for the kids so it's just not like let's leave you there doing nothing i don't know i i took it so that it was very much simply we well, leave yeah. you there to do nothing okay could and, be. but yeah, yeah. and all, all the digging the trenches and having ammunition and hellman giving his rifle to one of the kids is is simply the army trying to give the kids this well you were in the war moment yeah Hellman most notably, in my opinion, in the film, is on the kids' side. Uh, and he is very sympathetic towards the kids. And his rationality, to me, appears to be that he tells the kids to do this soldiering stuff now. Now dig the trenches and set up a card and have a card post and all this soldiering stuff. So that the kids can feel that they are also soldiers and they are taking part in the war. And Helma is just counting that he lets them to be soldiers for the night. And at the morning he just orders them off the bridge. And walks them back to the barracks or back to the village. And mm -hmm. then they, you know, just wait for the allies to cross the bridge. And then they will, when it's safe, they will go out and blow the bridge like they are supposed to. Because military orders and... Things like such. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that is the whole plan that the army has for the kids. And 
the reason why it ends up like it ends up is because Hellman has a unfortunate running in with the idiotic town police and unfortunately ends up getting killed in the process and because of this the line of communication gets cut and the kids do not get the information that holding the bridge is completely unnecessary and no one else except Hellman actually understands to go and tell the kids that you know just get out of there the holding the bridge is not worth it we are going to blow it anyway the next morning yeah but even still it seems that it's kind of expensive to leave the kids there since they leave so much ammunition behind of course to make it also believable for the kids that they are doing something worthwhile but anyway then there is the street man who comes to warn the kids and uh, making matters even more worse or more sad that they do not take there's only Hans who kind of gives some value to the guys lessons or the words and the rest just kind of shrug it off like a crazy guy who is afraid of the war yeah then again also the street guy that comes to the bridge kind of fails in the communication in a sense that yeah he does not say it out loud to the kids what he has seen un- yeah. Yeah, what he has seen and how unnecessary there the guard post on the bridge really is. Yeah, there's more cars now crossing the bridge. The kids first barricade the road and the rest of the soldiers flee and there's bands, there's some injured people. There's one officer with the knight's cross and Jürgen seems to be quite starstruck at the moment but at the same time also says that they are all fleeing, they are cowards and so on. And um, one of the injured guys, I believe, talks to Siggy and says that have some candy before they put you in a box. The kids wonder what's the box and, well, I would say we know what kind of a box they are talking about. It doesn't take long until there is some use for one. Hans is now the first guy to say that they should go home, but then turns around in that decision because he realizes that his friend Albert, which he is supposed to protect, which he has promised to protect in this war, he says that he will stay, so also Hans has to stay and everybody else stays as well. Yeah, there is once again on the show the misguided ideas. Yeah. And the group uh, group pressure that comes uh, comes yeah. from those ideas. There's so many chances here to save the day, but no, all the wrong choices. So yeah, the, yeah. the bridge scene very much is wrong choices. The movie in all the senses. And now there is the air raid. Siggy is seen as kind of the coward because he's the one who ducks. And the others didn't. Now for the second time when it comes, of course, Siggy is under the group pressure and gets killed before because of this. Now he's the one who is staying up. It's it's sad and really tough to watch. It's the first kill of this film. And... or is it? I think so. It is, yeah. Well, yeah, Heilman dies first. First kid to die is Siggy. Then the officers notice Panzer tanks, and this is kind of weird. They go to the cellars, and it looks like they are prepared for like a supreme attack in case they would cross the bridge. And that's what they are said to be later to be wanting. It's the bomb group at Siggy's mother's house, and they say that, oh, I wish the little heroes would stop playing war games and just let the Americans. What is that all about? Because they are supposed to blow the bridge at dawn or something like this. So, okay, I thought the idea would be better if they would first blow the bridge. Now the Americans cannot cross it. Okay, and now they can shoot them from the other side from a distance. I think it's much better than letting the tanks first inside the town. I would say the majority of the population should be existing there, right? And how the hell are you going to fight against tanks? anyway in that area and is it worth of military tactics to take this risk to get the tanks inside the people's area so yeah to me it appeared so that well the military already knows that the tanks are going to reach the town no matter what like they they can't held off the allied forces they are going to get into the town and somewhere on the high command there has become the order to explode basically all the bridges 
And that is why the bomb squad has to explode the bridge at some point, but even the bomb squad is not kind of a crazy enough to do that when the allies are still near to the bridge. So they are extremely happy to just wait that the allies pass by and once they are safely gone and reach the town after that they will hit the bridge and blow it up just so that they can say that yeah we did follow the orders and we did blow up the bridge as requested. Yeah. Okay, so the tanks finally arrive after a lot of anticipation. I love this moment before the tanks arrive. It takes kind of a while, you just hear the screeching of those tanks and there they finally come. And the pyrotechnics are great, there is nothing to complain in the effects department as far as I'm concerned in, in this film. Of course the tanks, you know, might for some tank expert immediately appear as fake tanks. Didn't pay attention to that by my, myself, but yeah, it's apparently, I believe it's some kind of trucks, it's kind of a cover of a tank. The story goes like this, that the, the US was somehow not very, not willing to give the, the US tanks for the filming of this. So they just have to make up some fake tanks. Not, not surprising that American yeah. military was not super, <laughs> not at all happy to kind of support German-made war movie. <laughs> and this is where the shit is starting to hit the fan. Crying in the modes, holding hands, and saying that all kinds of things, you're only good with the girls, I must get out, and all these irrational decisions like running in the way of the fire and just killing yourself, perhaps just to commit suicide basically, but uh, a lot is going on. Walter advances to towards the building while the others are giving him cover. Jürgen switches to pistol, Jürgen dies. Walter gets inside the house. Now the random person from the bridge is there, it's apparently his home or at least he's staying there right now and we get to know from him that the Americans are in the house and the women and children in the keller and so it is one of the americans just appears there i'm not sure exactly what happens here but if you look outside the window the tanks are right there and they are supposed to be right like mid five meters away. and then the walter does the amazingly great decision fire a rocket launcher towards the tank from that distance and is it then a is it then a dot and then it just burns the face of, of the guy who is behind the rocket launcher and that's all that seems to happen it then takes like 15 seconds and then the whole building collapses so it seems like a dot i i, I don't know i i took it understood that water did manage to actually destroy the tank I, i'm i'm not 100 percent sure of this because what happens in that scene is kind of a hard to follow. Yeah, well we are, I guess, then left to assume that the tank was all further away or... Yeah, h hard to say. My, my take was that water fires the anti-tank grenade at the tank, which is right next to him. So way too close to use these kind of explosives. The back muscle flash is what hits the old man in the face, burning his face and killing him there and... Because the explosion that happens from water firing the anti-tank grenade, because it's so close to the house, water inadvertently harms the house, and that is what causes that one side of the house collapses on top of water. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I it, it kind of makes sense, but l like I said, it's kind of a hard to follow on that scene what actually happens and why. For example, how much water manages to harm the house by firing a grenade on such of a close distance, that is not shown to you. Yeah. So what you, you are not completely sure why this, why does the house collapse on top of water? Yeah, it could be that the tank retaliated and just blew up the house without knowing that there were Americans inside. It could also be that. And. There is this one shot at a special close-up of eyes of Klaus when he's crying a little bit before he runs in the wet fire. I thought it was kind of interesting. There's a lot of kind of like experimental stuff it seems. And Albert gets shot in his arm. Then the tanks drive away for reinforcements or that's supposed to be what's happening. So happy times we have only two people left 
that is Albert and Hans. And now the goddamn bomb squad arrives and the kids are given the information that they are supposed to blow up the bridge. There is absolutely not much point at this point to blow up the bridge. Or, uh, well, yes there is, but th yeah, they could have been there like ages ago and informed the kids that they can go home, but nobody did that. Of course, it's totally possible that the timing just was off and since the kids were already fighting, they were not able to blow, blow the bridge and that is how they explain it as well. But now that the situation is over, they are there and they get extremely pissed off about this information and kind of understandably shoot the guy who seems to have no regard for their lives just makes fun of the kids and their efforts and only Albert survives who is kind of the Gregor of this story Gregor the writer of the book this is kind of a heartbreaking story and this is where it ends we get a camera drawing away from the bridge and that's it and there's a mention at the end credits that apparently this was so unimportant event on April 27, 1945, that it was not mentioned in any war communique. Quite an experience, this one. A powerful tour de force. In a way, yeah. In a way, I, I myself have to admit that having heard how basically strong and how effective film this was supposed to be before seeing this, I mean, they front cover of the DVD I have here says that skillful and ferocious a minutely observed almost unwatchable massacre of the innocents and this is from Time magazine yeah so of course I, I, I yeah. was kind of, kind of expecting something even more hard-hitting than the film in the end ended up being yeah I know what you mean like I said today's audience we like to expect something to be even more raw but at the end of the day it, the characters are extremely well built and at the end you you care about their fate maybe not cars and jurgens fuck those guys but yeah the rest of the kids were, were lost for no cause at all well i kind of I understand that of course these are all that's kind of the whole thing here they, these are all brainwashed kids by the propaganda and uh, the situation cannot be helped and it's not their fault and yeah no no it's 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 not uh, what really bugged me in Carl was that the all women are dirty approach which he takes Oh, in in well, the early of the film, but that kind of reverberates from the whatever happened at the home with Barbara, the father. So yeah, it, he, it it he's it, just a kid and kind of reflecting on that. He he is he is and he's well, like like you said, it it comes from a girl having affection towards a woman who is in relationship with his father. Yeah. And coming to realize this all of a sudden because he had not picked up on this previously when he had grown these affections. But still, Gar goes straight to the deep end with his all women are filth and whores attitude, which I was kind of a, And he fucking does not let go of that sentiment at no point of the film to, to a point where Gar himself even fucks up the possibility of communication with the American troops when he overreacts to the word kindergarten used mm. by the American. So Carl is a bit too hot-headed for my taste, especially when contrasted to the rest of the punch. And with Jürgen, my main problem is his enthusiasm towards military valor and the military merits. To me, Jürgen very much appeared as a character whose love for getting a merit to be noted would be kind of so strong that would he actually ever become a general 
or an officer, there would be a very high risk that Jürgen would get the troops under his command killed because he would push them too far and push them into two dangerous situations simply because he wants to get those merits, because he wants to be able to say that I led these troops which did this thing and he would in that moment he would hold no regard on the danger he would put his troops in. Yeah, there's some quickies apparently that we should tackle. Favorite performance Henrik? To me, it's, it's a tie. It's very strong tie between Volker Bohner, who plays Hans, and I don't even know how you pronounce this, Günther Fritzmann, who plays Helman, the corporal overseeing the kids in the film. It's very tight competition between the two of them. If I have to pick, I guess I will go with Volker. Simply because, as Hans, he gets a couple of more emotional moments in the film. He has a couple of moments where he can play even a higher emotion than the character of Halman is ever given. Yeah, actually I had Volker in my mind as well. He, and he has maybe the most to do here in a range of acting. Has the girlfriend, has the scene where he's terrified of the friend's death and then runs on the way of the bullets and all that. So uh, yeah, and I liked his performance favorite scene like I said that, yeah. that is when yeah I will go with kind of basically when the things get insane after the tanks have arrived I would say kind of when the character of Klaus runs in the way of the bullets that's that kind of says it all things go insane uh, yeah favorite quote if any I guess and this is going to be a cliche from my end, but my pick is when Walter's father says to him, the army will make a man of you, and it damn sure did. Yeah, that's a really, really good one. Always good to cho choose this one. I'll just go with your quote. Favorite kill. Yeah, I'll just skip this one. I'll you cheating one. bastard. I, I, I on my end, because I, I have no heart. And my emotional side is a black void. I, I can actually pick a favorite kill from this film. And I would actually choose Jürgen's death when he impotently tries to use his pistol to kill a far away target and gets shot with a stomach for his troubles. Good job, Jürgen. You goddamn idiot. Yeah. I guess here I just... I'll just be... More compassionate than usual. I'll, I'll just pass. I'll just pass. But I guess, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> the easiest choice would be to not choose the kids, so then I would choose the Corporal Heilman. Which is a terrible choice as well, because it's the reason why everything goes to hell. Yeah, uh, su surprisingly, in a war movie that has a bunch of kids dying, there really is no death that you can really get behind of. Like... So something that you can really actually cheer like yeah i'm so glad that that guy died e even as much as i have against jürgen and karl in this film you know it still is kids dying what's your favorite german beer i guess warsteiner even if if that is extremely mainstream pick first image that comes to mind henry i would say it's the it's the kids hitting the deck in the basic training. More precisely that shot when they have taken cover and Siggy raises his head to look forward. For now, in my mind, it's replaying the scene where Jürgen is falling from the tree and, and dying and also when he kills some <laughs> Americans and gives this kind of a <laughs> funny smile at the camera. <laughs> yeah, that was also something that really bugged me in, in Jürgen and with his affection to military merits. Yeah. He's the one who appears to be most excited when he manages to kill someone. Yeah, I don't know, maybe that's just the war psychology that, you know, of course, you know, this might get to you. You are in a safer place when you get rid of them. Yeah, I, I took it as a combination of propaganda and Jürgen seeing that yeah. he has a chance to earn a merit earn a medal or something like that that he can show to everybody to show that he has merited in the army and he's a stuff of an officer 
so which, to say. Which image best exemplifies this film? I guess that would be Hans walking away from the bridge. Or Albert. I guess that would be Albert walking away from the bridge at the very end of the film. Yeah, it's one of the full shots of the bridge. Probably the most I have in mind, the final shot, like you. What took me out of this film? Or what took Henrik out of this film? It, it was that one moment when Carl, uh, after seeing his father with the lady, in shock, decides to try to dig his eyes out. Mm -hmm. This is a tough one. Perhaps extramarital affairs at the house. So, kind of, same thing repeated. Well, what pulled you in, Henrik? Um, the, the weapon inspection that that Hellman performs in the film. To me, Hellman, l like I said before, Hellman was one of the most sympathetic adult characters in the film and the character that was most on the kid's side throughout the film and was kind of a trying to give the kids a LARP so that they can feel that they, they have been doing some good old soldiering and the first time I got that notion from Helmon was during that weapon inspection scene. So I guess that was the one that put me in. Yeah, I also liked all the scenes with the corporal. Because you can tell from the scene that he's just trying to be the good guy and understands that he just wants to protect these kids and understands that they are kids and doesn't want to put them in the harm's way. And, well, he's a corporal. Maybe corporals generally can be nicer, that's at least my experience, than higher ranking officers, or just complete assholes. Well, what pulled me in, I guess that's the moment when the tanks arrive, it's what, we, what we've been waiting for, in good and bad. What's your like most strongest standing act, one, two or three? Well, not surprisingly, the third act, yeah, when yeah. the attack happens and the fighting starts. Same, same. What's the most exciting moment? I guess that would be when Walter is making his dash towards the house with the anti-tank uh, grenade launcher. Mm. Perhaps the most disturbing moment is still when the first kid dies, Siggy, and his friend is crying like, Come here, come here. Uh, Scissors of Sacrilege, what would you change in the film? I guess I wouldn't change. Yeah. Anything. It's actually... This is kind of a yeah. This is kind of a tough question because, uh, like I said, in some way, I expected something even more horrific from the film. At this point, in a current year, two thousand nineteen, we, the audience, have kind of been spoiled by anti-war films. Then again, I think the the, the, the still because it's only fourteen, fifteen years after the war, so I think it kind of resonates. In, in this film in a different way than in many other films made after it. So people can still kind of identify with those feelings and this, these people lived through the war. So I think there is something kind of different that you would not get every day out of your war flick. But uh, uh, there, yeah. there is at least, you know, very heartbreaking fight scene. Yeah. The third act of the film, which does kind of drive home the point since before that scene, you already know how pointless the fighting is. That the bridge has no merit at all, and defending the bridge is completely pointless. And then you see this bunch of kids fighting against an enemy military for no cause at all. It is something that is extremely sad to see in the film. The third act is very sad in all the best ways. Yeah, and I think quite brilliantly acted. Of course, this is something that must be mentioned that the director actually, because these were also all amateurs, he tried to get the best out of them performance-wise, so he would shove some sand in their faces before shooting, so he would get the genuine cries or, or mortified feelings, and also slapping them in their faces before shooting. <laughs> That, that sounds actually quite a lot like a boot camp. But I would add also that, well, it might not feel like a very genuine story after something like this, but when the shootings ended, he would then kind of 
say in his own way thank you and sorry for all of this and give them hugs and give them coffee. <laughs> I, I, I was expecting that he would have just slapped them in the face one more time. <laughs> <laughs> you really know you're watching the Brücke when... Dot, dot, dot. You see a bunch of kids and feel it's going to end badly. You see a bridge. You see tanks. <laughs> That's my wonderful input. Uh, three adjectives to describe the film. I would go with gut wrenching uncompromising and kinda pointless. And these are all adjectives that I tie very tightly to that third act of the film. Heartbreaking, brutal, futile. Watch test, did you look at your watch? No, I was kind of expecting that I would do that, especially in the first and second act of the film. I was afraid that my thirst for carnage in this film would drive me <laughs> to check my watch, but I did not yeah, end know, up checking my watch. I would say that for an old film like this, I would say that the pace is quite dense and it always keeps on going and going and going forward, even though they spend a lot of time to prep the story up and the background of the several kids. But uh, yeah, it's fast paced and as noted before, it's hard to keep up even with the subtitles. With many of the older films, there is the saving grace that helps immensely with the pacing of the films that back in the days, the average running length of the film was somewhere from hour and a half to two hours. And not every single film needed to last from three to five hours like it is today. <laughs> Henrik, would you recommend the Brücke? I would, with the caveat that this may not be the anti-war film to end all anti-war film. As an anti-war film, even though it's it's effective, it is something that really has cinematic merits. Like it's it's a film that deserves to exist, but today it may no longer be the most hard-hitting, most uncompromising, kind of the most audience-testing film experience, or the most tackling anti-war film that you can see. Mm, this is why I never read the backsides of the DVD covers, because then I would be up for disappointment. The most amazing war film of the entire galaxy forever and ever. And I think you have gotten some kind of a wrong connotations about this film going into. This is why it's better to just skip reading in most cases about any of the film or, or visit IMDb. Maybe it gives a more like a balanced perspective or not. Just don't go watch anything. Yeah, I mean, the, the back cover of the DVD has has such quotations as superb. Without question, the successor of All Quiet on the Western Front. And the backside description has lines like is a gripping and shocking anti-war movie and an uncompromising look at the cruelty and absurdity of war. Yeah, and I think at the time it was really cruel. And, 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 and if you put your head into it in that kind of uh, time and thoughts of those times, I think it works wonderfully well still but uh, I see your point but I would say that it still works it does work and because of that I still end up recommending the film yeah yeah I would absolutely recommend Die Brücke and of course once again I might have a little special relationship with the film because I actually saw it as a kid but even that cast aside solid film moves fast time flies when watching it and action is great there's no nothing to complain about the cutting or ho how the scenes are put together, it's easy to follow and very tragic. If nothing else, this is kind of the anti-war film where I feel that the objective that has to be reached, in this case, you know, defending the bridge, in here it is the most pointless objective of any anti-war film. Yeah, good point, okay. There are many war films, of course, that show how pointless the war can be. But uh, it's interesting that you know that such that this could be a given special merit in that regard. Yeah, I, I don't re remember any other war film where where the end goal would be 
so small and yeah, so yeah. In- insignificant as defending a bridge which has no strategic value at all. Not sure if you read this, Henrik, but there is a little bit of a tragic comment from the director. You know, he had huge success with Die Brücke, but he then went on to say, quote, In truth, throughout my entire life, I have felt like an absolute outsider, not because I wanted to be. I always felt I was superior to almost every other person. In actuality, I'm a person whose life has been wrought with failure, no matter if it was the simple things or success. Of course, I desperately wanted to relive the success I had with the bridge, but I did everything in my power to ensure that didn't happen. I always destroyed that possibility through my choice of subject matter and how I filmed that subject. End of quote. I hope he didn't go into his deathbed with very bitter thoughts. He did make classic and it's damn hard to get, you know, this guy was lucky getting into international stage and so early on in the Academy Awards history. Still an extremely sad sentiment. Yeah, it's hard to be happy in this life. But it is. Also, dear listeners, I think it should be repeated that the depicted events of the film took place in real life exactly 74 years ago. And the end title say this event occurred on April 27th, 45. It was so unimportant that it was never mentioned in any war communicate. Henrik, we can be found on several deepest levels of hells. Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Twitter. You are welcome That to. is pretty deep levels of hell, I have to admit. Yeah, several layers of pure plasma. We also have the International Cinema Challenge going this year. As some of our listeners may know, if this is a new thing for you, we will be watching 20 specific films this year from different countries. And to join the challenge, you just have to watch all the films that we are watching, and then you can listen to our wonderful podcast episodes after you have done so, and continue the discussion afterwards in our several deepest levels of hell. And you can also take on the lightweight challenge, which means that you can watch 20 films. They can be also from different countries, but they don't necessarily need to be exactly the films that we are watching. And God knows it is extremely hard or basically impossible to find some of these films, even though kind of going into this, we tried to make sure all the films are available, but they are not as available as they were a couple of months ago. Things and uh, stock happens to dwindle. Henrik, where do we go from here? I guess you are going inside, since you are already (laughs) freezing to death at the park. (laughs) Is it so obvious? Let me see our next film. Would that be the Ghost in the Shell? Extremely easily approachable sci-fi anime. Well, I guess it has to be done at some point. You have been talking a lot of good things about it, so... Maybe we should take a look at yet another anime in this podcast. It's kind of some of the essentials, so let's let's get to it. I, I, I just hope that you have actually seen it previously, and this is not your first viewing of the oh, film. Oh, of course. Uh, big fan. Let's get to it. <laughs> because, goddamn, are you in for a shock when you try to follow the plotline for the first time? <laughs> well, we are always looking for the challenge, the laboratory. Henrik, I'm entering my car. I don't have a driving's license, but I'm getting out of the parking lot. I hope it's not your car. Absolutely not. Well, I I, I am happy for you. It's a good way to actually enhance your finances. Remember to take it to some chop shop very quickly before the cops get to you. Uh, unless I manage to drive it into a tree before that. But, but to anyone who has been wondering how do we actually finance doing this podcast with no sponsors and no listeners and no Patreon page. This is how. Yeah, it's called slavery in Poland. (laughs) (laughs) And a car checking in everywhere else. (laughs) Alright, I try to get out of this park alive. There's some light here in the park, but it's going to be a challenge to my way the hell out of here. To these wonderful thoughts and feelings, until next week. See you then.
jossain vaiheessa bussimatkaa. Itsekin alan olemaan bussissa. Bu- bussi ei välttämättä. Se on bussissa. Se on 12 tuntia bussissa. Se on bussissa ei kannata nauhoittaa. Se on bussissa. Siis ihan suoraan. Bussissa, 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 bussissa.